Uh, my name is Karim, uh, and I'm a designer. Um, and uh, I guess I'm a. I call actually call myself a little bit. I know it's a bit arrogant, but I call myself a, a cultural shaper, really, because I think that's what design does: shapes human behavior. Well, you know, it's interesting that we've gone through many schools of design. In fact, I think the, the introduction of design obviously is from the Industrial Revolution because the industrial designer never existed before the Industrial Revolution. There was artisans and there were architects and there were engineers. And then we needed a new profession, really, a designer. And the designer, in a way, I think, started out in a way that he was or she was a kind of liaison between the manufacturer and everyday life. So somehow, the designer's job, in a way, I think, till today, is to kind of humanize industry, uh, which I've always believed was the case. At the same time, with humanizing industry, I think the designer is also to kind of shape and move us forward, kind of evolve human culture. And I think design, for a very long time, was maybe more concerned with the decorative. Uh, you know, the old story is Singer, for example, when they had to make a sewing machine and they had to bring a sewing machine into the home, domesticize the sewing machine, they kind of made it decorated so that it felt fit into the home. But we've gone so much beyond decoration. So at first, I think designer's job was visual. Then it became form. Then it became semantic. I think then after that, it finally has moved into a time now where design is very much about a sensorial experience. So design is really in a way to touch all the senses, which is really, you could argue, to shape a human experience. I think the most important role that designer can play today is to really push the boundaries to show that design is inseparable from in, uh, innovation, in a way. The last thing a designer should do as a role today is to try to reiterate or make derivatives of history. Because design is you shape something now in order to shape social and human behavior for the future. Design is not really about styling by appropriating history and trying to kind of decorate um, our present world. The best thing a designer could do, and I try to do this, it's hard to do, is to A, let go of the archetype, and B, to try to see yourself almost like a child in the sense that even though you know have an education and knowledge and experience and, and all this, to kind of be perceptive enough as, as if you've never seen or this world ever in the past. So you're very naive you know, in a strange way. So you know, I play this game with myself. On one hand, I'm kind of relatively you know, well-read and relatively intellectual. On the other hand, I try to become really naive like a child to see something for the first time. And that kind of naivete, I think, is very important because then you can really observe the kind of human condition and then really respond to the prevailing human condition. Design does contribute to social change if it's design. If it's styling, it doesn't. If it's design, it does. So, you know, design, if it's about kind of using new technologies, new production methods, concerned about new social and human behaviors, if it's about kind of shaping a kind of new language that's going to move us and evolve us forward, of course, then it's making enormous social change. I don't know, you know, I don't think the agenda of design is to tell stories, frankly. I don't really believe in that kind of narrative school. That was something that happened back in the 80s, and everything had to kind of be animated and talk about something. I think design today is to really respond to a plethora of criteria, but reality is, is to do something really smart, experiential, ecological, beautiful, and that, again, to kind of evolve us and move us forward. That's design. We live in a disposable world and we, we, nobody wants to seem to admit this, so I don't know what lifetime means really, frankly. I think that we need to address our issues of the moment and take some responsibility in it, meaning that whatever we do and we put out in the world, we should be thinking about the future of this world. But in reality, consumption is on a very, works on a very, very quick, uh, immediate and kind of disposable level. And let's, you know, let's face it, I mean, we look at the culprit of something like the automobile, it's changing every year for the sake of just style in a way and it's it's just kind of destroying the earth so the fact is we live in disposable society so the answer is much bigger I think than a designer can really address 
more well known you get, and I, I think about this a lot, uh, as I've become more known, I realize I have a lot of power and I have a lot of responsibility. The way to really use it is a kind of in a teacher role, to make sure that younger generations understand the direction of design, that you don't mislead them, that they actually kind of understand their responsibility in the world. Design can be an agent for good. I think it's obvious. I think a lot of designers have a lot of great ideas. The, the hardest part about design a lot of times is that the clients and the companies, their expectation from you a lot of times is more on a kind of styling or a more form generation end. But you have the designer, what you've got to do is responsible to push companies to think about using sustainable materials, ecological materials, smart ideas. It's up to you in a way as a designer to kind of take hold of the, the project in a way and kind of push companies to do good in the world. I mean, that's, a rea that's, that's the reality. It's, it's easier said than done. Let's, let's admit that. You know, it's, that's a great question. I love that question because I think, frankly, design used to be based on the success of, let's say, you do something that's so profound in a way that it ends up in a museum. For me, today's success is when you make something that sells millions and millions and millions. Because if you sell, do something that sells millions, it means that it's really addressing a necessity, a need, and or a desire. So if I make something, I'll give you an example, like I made a thing called Bobble, which is to drink filter water. In, in a few months, they ship 15 million of these things because we're addressing a, a real need, we're addressing a real problem, but we're solving it in a very kind of contemporary, and in a sense, you could argue, a very nice and human way. So that I think, for me, right now, personally, a museum for me is, is an average person's home. It's not a, uh, an antiquated idea of what the museum was. I just turned 50 and my, my, I think every day about uh, the aging population. I'm on the tail end of the baby boomers. We have 70 million retired people in America. We have 82 retired people next year in Western Europe. So we need to design things that are going to address the aging population. And remember, the baby boomers are the ones that were really brought up with high design, meaning, okay, so now let's say I'm 70, 75. My expectation is that the goods I need to maneuver in this world have to be beautifully designed like the things I was brought up with. So I think addressing aging population for me is something I want to address, but I think it's very important to go back to these ideas of universal design where we make things that work for everybody.